So I, I still do the business divorce or the law firm divorce litigation. You know, most of the time we get that resolved short of actual filing lawsuits, although I did file one yesterday. And so I still do that and it's seasonal. So, you know, as you know, a lot of lawyers wait till they get their year end bonus or whatever, and then they decide to leave or they announce in January. So this is the time. And the first quarter is when these sorts of disputes sort of really start bubbling up and they can last all year. But so I still do that. And that's where I started, but I started to see all the issues we were litigating. So I had to become an ethics expert. And if they had written agreements, they usually weren't really built for the issues we were litigating. Welcome to the Renegade Lawyer Podcast, the show where we ask the questions, why aren't more lawyers living flourishing lives and inspiring others? And can you really get wealthy while doing only the work you love with people you like? Many lawyers are. Get ready to hear from your host, Ben Glass, the founder of the law firm Ben Glass Law in Fairfax, Virginia, and Great Legal Marketing, an organization that helps good people succeed by coaching, inspiring, and supporting law firm owners. Join us for today's conversation. Hey everyone, this is Ben. Welcome back to the Renegade Lawyer Podcast, where each episode I get to interview people inside and outside of legal who are making a ding in the world. Today we've got a very, very important interview with my friend, Jonathan Hawkins. Jonathan is a member of our Hero Mastermind Group here at Great Legal Marketing. That group largely consists, if I could generalize, of lawyers who are making that move from the lawyer who is a lawyer and does everything and now has a business, has a practice, to something bigger than that. Many of them want to scale. They have lots of questions about bringing on help and partners and of counsel relationships and things like that. Succession, I mean, what happens if I, you know, something happens to me and I can't practice? And Jonathan is always raising his hand and piping in because Jonathan's business is really being the lawyer's lawyer. His law firm is law firm GC. He's out of Atlanta, Georgia. And today we're going to talk about like, it's almost the, it's the necessary part of entrepreneurism that most of us don't like to deal with, which is regulatory structure, I think, and contracts and things like that. Jonathan's got an interesting background because it wasn't what you would call a typical pre-law background in undergrad. He's an engineer by birth and education. However, after going to law school, he's worked in the legislature as legal counsel to the Judiciary Committee of the Georgia House of Representatives. He's been a, a clerk to a federal judge in Georgia, I suspect. And we're glad to have you as part of the group, Jonathan. We're glad to have you as, as part of this podcast today. Happy to be here and glad to be part of the group. I've gotten a lot out of it so far. Yeah. And you also have your own podcast, the Founding Partners Podcast. So I'd recommend everybody like go and listen to a couple episodes and add that to your list. Because most of whom we talk to on this podcast are the solo and small firm lawyer owners across America and, in, and into Canada. So good. So, Jonathan, let's just talk a little bit about that, about, about that background and why aren't you an engineer someplace? You know, I'm a third generation engineer. I'm a third generation Georgia Tech engineer. So I guess, you know, I was always good at math and science. I didn't really give much thought about it. Went to engineering school. But before I graduated, I knew I did not want to be an engineer, but I was far enough along. I just said, all right, I'll just finish it. I did not know what I wanted to be. So I just knew I did not want to be an engineer. So after that, I took some time off and just sort of, I'll call it goofed around, moved around a little bit, did a lot of different types of jobs. And as you know, you know, I talked to a lot of young people in my life and many of whom are in high school thinking about going to college and things like that. Right. And so, it, it, and you have this heritage of engineers in your family. I'm curious now, at what point in the engineering schooling journey did you say, nah, I don't think this is for me? Well, you know, I'd say probably halfway through when I went, I thought I was going to go into like finance or commercial real estate. That's development. That's really sort of wanted, what I wanted to do. The engineering degree I had is, I call it sort of a business engineering degree. At some point, I, I decided I didn't want to do any of that. I just knew that I did not want to go be an engineer. That's just not what I wanted to do. It's interesting. My dad is also, he's largely retired, but he's, he became, he was an engineer and then became a lawyer. And at the time I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer either for sure. I was like, I'm not going to be a lawyer. What, how did that change? 
You know, it's funny. So, so you asked the question, so I was at undergrad and I did not know what I wanted to do. I went to career services and I took all these assessments and all these tests and they came back with the top 10 careers that I should pursue. And I think five of them were different types of lawyers. And at the time I just did not want to do it. I wanted to do my own thing, but you know, so after school, I lived in Costa Rica for a while, ran out of money, came back, did some odd jobs here and there, then went to Colorado and worked for a ski season. And when I was out there, that's when I decided I need to get serious. I was meeting, you know, it was fun, but I was meeting, you know, 40 year old ski bums that had moved out there when they're 18. And that's when I said, all right, I can't be that. I got to get serious. And so then I said, all right, I'll just go, I'll go practice law. How old were you then when you entered law school? Um, I was probably about 23, maybe. Okay. So maybe. this is pre-marriage? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the journey from there, I know you, and I said, you know, you'd clerk for a federal judge. You've done some other things in the legal profession. And then we have landed on your own law practice and then a real sub niche a highly valued sub niche, but a real sub niche of legal. So walk us through the journey of finding your space in the legal marketplace. You know, that's an interesting question. And I talk to folks about this a lot too. I'm a big believer in the niche practice and it's not something that just hit me one day. It was a step-by-step -step slow process over many years. You know, I started out after the clerkship, I did med mal insurance defense work. I loved it in the sense that I got a lot of experience very quickly, you know, depositions, yeah. trials, I was traveling all over the place, but I did not like the medicine and I just did not like it. And then from there I went and started doing business litigation and got exposed to all sorts of type, you know, litigation there. And then I started gravitating towards business divorce litigation. And that's really where I was. And then my dad, the practice I have now, which, you know, is largely representing lawyers, small firms and business related stuff. My dad had done some law firm breakups where I grew up down on the Gulf Coast. And he had done a, a good number of those in the span of a short span of years. And he said, if I'm doing this many down here, there's going to be tons of them in Atlanta. You should check it out. And so because he sort of suggested it, I just started looking at it. And that started the path to where I am now. I think there's a, I think there's a huge need for this. You know, when, so I'm in law practice with my son, Brian, and, you know, we as we joined forces and he bought into the firm, we did sort of a back of the napkin deal. And then we each went out and got our own lawyers just to, and the value there, the high value there was in each of them showing us things that we hadn't even thought about. Not that there was any, you know, antagonism or anything like that, but it's like, all right, what if this happens? What if this happens? You know, if one of you is incapacitated or passes away, like how are we going to fund the buyout of the shares and all that stuff? And we're like, ah, oh. we didn't even know to ask those questions. And then the whole deal was blessed by my wife and his mom. And so that was the ultimate, the ultimate arbiter. What's it like to have lawyers as clients? Because our, you know, I don't want to upset any of your current clients, but in the personal injury field, like we find that challenging. To have lawyers as clients, even when they're, especially when they're not personal injury lawyers. So I, I have had a few challenging client, lawyer clients over the years, but largely they've been great. And I, I've enjoyed representing the lawyers. And part of it is every firm is a little bit different. The personalities surely are different, but the business models are different. The types of law they practice, the way they charge their clients, whether it's high volume, low volume, all these different types of practices. And I just really, I'm really interested in it. So you know, it's fun for me to get to know the person, the lawyer, the partners, but also just the way they do their business. And every new firm I represent, I get a new little piece of information that just adds to the, the you know, the repertoire. Yeah. I mean, you're sitting in the middle of a lot of guys and gals with a lot of ideas, most of them probably good, some of them horrible and learning all of which I'm sure blends over into some decisions that you're making in your own life and your own practice. So let's talk about that next. Talk to us a little bit about the practice. I'm not even sure if you're doing any business, any law firm divorce litigation, or if your whole work is in preventing the spending of time, energy, and money on law firm divorce litigation. But how is your own work today? This is the first quarter of 2024. We're recording this. How's your own work split up? 
So I, I still do the business divorce or the law firm divorce litigation. You know, most of the time we get that resolved short of actual filing lawsuits, although I did file one yesterday. And so I still do that and it's seasonal. So, you know, as you know, a lot of lawyers wait till they get their year end bonus or whatever, and then they decide to leave or they announce in January. So this is the time and the first quarter is when these sorts of disputes sort of really start bubbling up and they can last all year. But so I still do that. And that's where I started, but I started to see all the issues we were litigating. So I had to become an ethics expert. And if they had written agreements, they usually weren't really built for the issues we were litigating. So then I started drafting the agreements based on all the stuff we were fighting about. So I find that continuing to litigate and do the dispute part of it really helps improve the quality of the written product of the agreements that, that the lawyers really need. And it helps me see what's going on. Yeah. So they, they sort of symbiotic and the way I describe it now, it's from formation to dissolution and everything in between. Although there are a couple of things I don't do, but. Can you walk us through like, what are some, what are the sort of the main things that lawyers <clears throat> dispute about or f fight about when they're going through any sort of a dissolution. And then we can talk about solving or preventing issues. I always think it's money, but it might not be money at the top of the list. What is, what is it lawyers fight about? Certainly money in a contingency practice. It's about the good cases. Sometimes it's about staff or other attorneys. You know, I want them or whatever. And then, you know, there's some other things too. It's just the visions have changed. You want a big firm. I want a small firm. You want to work all the time. I want to be at the beach all the time. And if you don't have a mechanism to separate in that situation, there's going to be resentments that build. And, you know, some people feel like I'm doing all the work and you're just coasting those sorts of disagreements. And so, you know, bigger picture in law, in the law practice, that's different than maybe other businesses. You can't have restrictive covenants with the lawyers so they can leave at any time. You can't lock down clients so they can leave at any time. And so if a lawyer wants to leave, they basically, if they have a relationship with the client, they can tell them, Hey, I'm leaving. You get to choose. Do you want to come with me? And that's really where the big fights are. Let's say that a couple of guys and gals come to you and they say, Jonathan, we like each other. We've got sort of similar practice area ideas. We think that it would be fun to work together in a partnership or some sort of business arrangement. We've heard your horror stories. We've listened to your podcast and we want to make sure that if this doesn't work out philosophically for us, that we are able to efficiently terminate and dissolve. Let's go down if we can sort of the checklist of things you would be talking to them and about and recommending that we create or do as we're forming this new law firm. Well, the first thing I always recommend, I have a list of questions that really have nothing to do with the legal aspects of a firm. It's really more about vision, values, you know, those sorts of things, workloads, responsibilities. And I say, you people, you two, three, however many, you need to go and have some serious discussions about these questions and really make sure at this point you're on the same page. You want to go to the same places. If you're not on the same page now, and I say, be honest with yourselves. And if you're not on the same page now, you shouldn't do it. That's sort of the first thing. If they come back and say, all right, we really want to do it. Then, you know, the big, there's really big things. I call them exit ramps. You know, we want to you know, account for retirement, death, disability, withdrawal, voluntary withdrawal, expulsion for cause, you know, a bad boy type provision. And if you're big enough, maybe expulsion for not for cause. And then the other scenario would be sort of a full on disillusion. So you can get rid of somebody and maybe continue the organization or you can officially dissolve it. So those are the big things we talk about. You know, some of the other things are long-term obligations, leases, those sorts of things, personal guarantees, lines of credit, you know, that could become an issue too. If everybody's signed onto that as personal guarantors or just personally on those agreements, you're going to have to deal with that if, and when you go your separate ways. Do you find lawyers who come to you are relatively sophisticated and knowledgeable 
about things like leases and guarantees and personal guarantees? Or is it more like they think they know, but they don't really? You're laughing. <laughs> That's a loaded question. You know, there's some that, you know, there are lawyers out there that are way smarter than I am. You know, they do deal lawyers, that sort of thing. They come to me and they sort of know all these things. Doesn't mean they really apply it to themselves, but they know some of these things. And then there's others that don't know anything about it. They are completely unsophisticated. You know, I've dealt with business people that have more knowledge about these things than the lawyers do. And just because they're lawyers doesn't mean they know about this. So, so it, you get a bunch of visionaries in the room and none of us might know about any of the details of things like personal guarantees. I can absolutely see that happening. And you, and the visionaries, they see nothing but all the good stuff at the end, you know, they don't see all the potential hiccups along the way. And that's sort of what I'm there for. And I'm not a dream killer. I'm a, you know, go for your dream, but let's just plan on just in case. Yeah. And so when you have this sort of conversations with the, uh, with the organizing group, do you, have you, you had instances where they come back and go, yeah, Hey, that was, those are really great questions. And we're not going to go do this. We're just, we just don't think we're actually matched philosophically. And thanks for prompting us with the right questions to ask. I have had that. Yes, I have had that. What do you think that, what do you think it is that drives that? They just thought this would be kind of fun to work together and I think so. Uh, You've probably seen this too, Ben. Lawyers, they say, hey, we're friends. And they have in their mind, they think our two practice areas, even though they really don't mesh, they have in their mind that, oh, we're going to refer each other work. And it's just going to be this big thing where really it just doesn't work. I'm sure you've seen this a lot. Two different practice areas that just maybe in theory might work together and refer. But when you actually get together, they're just not going to. Yeah, I think it would be important, and this is likely what you do, is you're helping them model out the future. So, so hey, guys and gals, let's say this really works, and you're all able to go and to get clients and to generate money, and five years down the road, you're all doing you know, 4X what you're doing right now today. What does that look like, and how is that going to make us feel? Because we might have decisions like, oh, but now we need another more office space and need more people. And that is not dream killer. I mean, that's really what you're supposed to be doing here. It's, you know, when we do a long-term disability pre-claim consult with a doctor, like my, my job is to hopefully make it so you don't need me for all the messy stuff later down the road. Like we're going to get this thing right, right the first time. Do these lawyers, Jonathan, then go as Brian and I did and get separate lawyers into individual counsel to review things or generally not? It happens occasionally, but not as often as you think. And it's, you know, and I can be engaged in different ways. Sometimes I represent one party. Sometimes I represent the firm who may be owned by one party and they're bringing a new partner, for example. So after the new partner's there, there'll be two of them. But at the time, there's only one, you know, in the non-dispute area, usually they don't go get other attorneys. Although, you know, it happens every now and then, but usually not. Yeah, I think in our case, like the lawyer I hired, he just recommended one of, one of his buddies. And I think it was the end of the day smart. It was a little frustrating for Brian and I because the list of things that they were coming back with that we hadn't thought about was maybe caused embarrassment because like, <laughs> like oh, no, we should have thought about that stuff. Talk to me a little bit about, all right, so you have a conversation or conversations. It's really good. You have them vision four and five years or more down the future. It's really good. And yet then four and five years, it doesn't work out. Even though they have had good counsel at the beginning, theoretically, they have thought about these issues. You've papered the issues. And maybe you haven't seen these. Maybe it is. If you talk to me early and talk to me right, we don't have these issues. But have you seen cases where issues do develop? And then if so, what is that all about? I mean, I will say there have been firms that I've helped partnerships that I've formed that didn't work out and then they've gone their separate ways. When they come back to me at that point, I can't really take sides. And I, so if it's going to go into litigation, you know, I'll refer them out to people, you know, even with the best argument, I mean, agreement in the world, people can still breach it. They can still lie, cheat and steal. So even though you have the agreement, people may not abide by it, but hopefully they do. You know, another big thing I put in these agreements are, mandatory sort of negotiation, mediation, arbitration provisions. Uh, I don't want 
people going to court. And it's funny, you know, you've got all these trial lawyers out there that we got to have jury trial. I recommend this. And they're all like, yeah, we want this. We don't want a jury trial for it. And I like, that's a great idea. You don't want this out there. It is a mess. You just get it would, in a private yeah. dispute place and just be done with it. You know, there are some, I have a friend in Pennsylvania and he sends me the headlines of the Pennsylvania, whatever the daily legal press is, because there's almost always some usually plaintiff contingent fee law firm that's breaking up and the pleadings are just fascinating to read. And now your stuff is spread out all over the place because they didn't have the let's mediate and negotiate in private behind a black door terms in their partnership agreements. And a lot of those fights are about the, the big one that came in. It's, it's hardly ever about the lack of money. It's always about when there is a lot of money coming in. Now, how are we going to, how are we going to split that up? That's awful. What do you, <coughs> excuse me. So again, someone who's thinking about forming a business relationship with another friend or cohort who's a lawyer. We see, Jonathan, these firms that are built and they are not really partnerships. If you look at it from the inside at all, they're generally expense sharing agreements. And then you have sort of true partnerships where profits are being divvied up. Could you talk for a moment to particularly maybe younger lawyers who are younger in the profession who may be thinking it would be fun to go practice with so-and-so? And there's at least these two models, and there's probably more. But what are the sort of choices that that lawyers have? Again, let's talk young lawyers in the profession in terms of getting together with, and combining with another lawyer to start a quote unquote business or law firm. That that's a great point. There are different ways to go at it. A full on partnership is a little bit harder to break away from. And so there are alternatives. So the sort of the expense share model or office share model you sort of mentioned there. Another might be an of counsel type relationship. So you're sort of in the same firm, but, but you're not. That's the other, the of counsel. Nobody, everybody uses that phrase and nobody knows what it means. In Virginia, it's like, it's even, it's really hard to go find out what that actually means. Yeah. It means a couple of things. The traditional Meaning was, you know, a retired partner, but there, there are a number of ethics opinions around the country. I know there's one in Georgia, there's an ABA one that, that basically defines what it is. And under the definition, you're basically in the same firm. It's, you're a close, continuous relationship. You got to run conflicts by everybody. You're deemed to be in the same firm, but it's a little bit looser than a partnership or a full-blown employment, employer-employee type relationship. So it's a little bit easier to break apart, in my opinion. So that'd be something to look at. Yeah, I've seen so I've seen some lawyers here in Northern Virginia. So you may have a lawyer who's who's a personal injury lawyer, and they're in a firm, and yet then they show up. I go on somebody else's website. So let's just say a family lawyer website, and there's my buddy, the personal injury lawyer who I know has got an established firm over here on the right hand, showing my right hand, and now he is listed as of counsel on the family law firm. And that lawyer has to, because you've brought this up several times in our meetings here, is has to do conflicts checks throughout both firms. Yes. So every new potential client for both firms have to be run through the other firms. So it can become unwieldy pretty quickly. You'd have to get that right and you'd have to have a system. And if you don't think about that when you're forming this, how hard can it be to be out of counsel? is what I would call that relationship. Yeah. That can be a real, a real problem. I think we're talking about sort of about these different, different models for young lawyers who are thinking about getting together. So you've got of counsel relationship, you have true partnership, you've got sort of office sharing. Is one better than the other? Or is this something that's now, hey, talk to me, Jonathan, let me figure out what your goals are together and what your strengths and weaknesses are. And let me at least give you some advice or a prescription for how to do this. Yeah, I would not say one's better than the other. It really depends on what the individuals want and what their vision is long-term. I will say sometimes we might, I might suggest one of the not full partnership structures as an intermediate step. You know, it's a way to date for a little while before you get married. 
And so oftentimes we will structure a sort of an in-between. They come to me and they say, we want to be partners. I say, hold on, wait a second, you know, answer these questions. Are you sure? And then maybe they say, well, maybe not, but we want to test it out and see if we can work well together. And then there are ways, intermediate steps you can do to sort of see, do we work well together? And if you do, then we can go to the next step. Another topic that gets discussed a lot in the Hero Mastermind group is, hey, I think it's, I own a firm. Maybe there's several lawyers here. I think it, it is time to bring on another lawyer. And a lot of discussion about, do I bring on somebody quote of counsel? Do I bring on somebody part-time? And if so, how do I compensate them? Do you have any strategies about the thinking about Jonathan, the thinking about bringing, you know, growth and bringing on like your first new lawyer to the firm? I do from doing it a lot. And from personal experience, you know, a lot of lawyers, solos, let's call it solos, their first foray into hiring an attorney. They say, I don't need somebody full-time, so I'll try a contract attorney. That can work. I've got a contract attorney and she's great, but she only works for me. A lot of times these contract attorneys have their own firm and they need to supplement their income. So they'll do contract gigs around. And so it might work for a little while, but as soon as that attorney gets busy with their own firm, they're gone. And so it, it, it oftentimes a contract approach doesn't work of counsel could be a similar approach. And so the question is, should you just hire a full-time attorney and what would that look like? So I can help. And then of course the compensation, we can talk about that too, but definitely I think how they approach it depends on what they're looking for. In the contract attorney model, you've given some good ideas some questions to ask, am I your only one? Are you working for five different lawyers? Do you have your own practice? What then does the, in best practices, Jonathan, does the contract look like? If you're the one that's doing the hiring, what do you want that agreement to be in, as best you can to prevent the problems you indicated, which is your work gets relegated to the bottom and then maybe doesn't get done. And now you're left wanting. Are there ways to protect yourself? You know, the contract attorney scenario is tough. You know, you could say, look, we could have put a provision in there that says you're only going to work for me or something close to that, or you're going to guarantee me X amount of hours per week, whatever it is. Another, we talked about this earlier, but conflicts, you know, if you've got a contract attorney that's working for five different firms, you really got to really pay attention to the conflicts issue. Cause I mean, can you imagine you give an assignment to this, the contract attorney they're like, wait, I've already been given an assignment on the other side of this case by this other attorney it would be terrible and might disqualify everybody. So you really got to pay attention to that. Hey guys, this is Ben. If you like what you've been hearing on this podcast, not just the marketing and practice building strategies, but the philosophy of the art of living your best life parts, you should know that my son Brian and I have built a tribe of like-minded lawyers who are living lives of their own design and creating tremendous value for the world within the structure of a law practice. We invite you to join us at the only membership organization for entrepreneurial lawyers that is run by two full-time practicing attorneys. Check us out at greatlegalmarketing.com. Well, let's talk a little bit about compensation. Again, we talk about this a lot in our meetings at the Hero Mastermind level and the Icon Mastermind level. I'm sure you have seen any number of models. I think the biggest question that younger lawyers who are starting up a firm and bringing on someone else have are like there, there's always kind of a fear factor of them not going to be able to afford the X salary that I think I need to pay. Our advice is always, you don't need to pay it all tomorrow, right? There's kind of eat what you kill models. There's models that are paying a percentage of the revenue you've brought in. Again, I'm always a strategic thinking guy. So what are some of the things that a lawyer who's thinking about bringing on talent and wants to attract talent, compensate, but not shoot himself or herself in the foot? What should they be thinking about? So I'll give the lawyer answer. It really, it depends on practice area and really geography as well. You know, depending on the talent pool and what's your, what's available, it may drastically change your approach. If it's 
a super competitive area, both in geography and practice area, you're just going to have to pay more and you're going to have to offer something that entices them to come. And then once they're there, hopefully if they're doing a great job, entice them to stay. And so, you know, I think the other piece too is, you know, do a lot of hybrid work environments, that sort of thing. But I think, you know, you're nowadays you're going to have to pay more than maybe you had six, seven years ago, for sure. I think, you know, incentives drive behavior. I'm a big believer in that. And so as you design a comp system, whether it be it for partners or for associates or whoever, think about what behaviors you want them to do, because whatever comp system you come up with, whatever formula you come up with, they are going to work to that at exclude everything else. And they're going to work to that. So, you know, another a mastermind member, Scott Snellings, he was on my podcast and we talked about his firm and, you know, he's big on the core values and he has a way to bonus his people on whether they adhere to the core values, which I thought was really interesting. So there are other sorts of factors and things you can put into a compensation plan that are not just how many clients you brought in, how much, you know, how many hours you worked, how many cases you settled, that sort of thing. So it's really, what do you, the law firm owner want to, what kind of behaviors do you want to drive? Do you have a recommendation? Because, you know, a compensation plan that I create for you today, if you're coming to my firm, doesn't have to be the compensation plan that we play with for the rest of yours and my career. So are there models which say, hey, for six months or 12 months or 18 months, we're going to operate under this, this model. And then we're going to come back together in good faith. And Jonathan, mm -hmm. I want to know like what's best for you. What do you want? Like what would be perfect for you is the question we ask. Is that, is this done typically in, in legal? Yes. I mean, compensation plans change. And I encourage people to be open to the change. Facts on the ground change. Things change. I would never do it more than once a year. That's just the most often. It's, but you don't want to do it in the middle of a calendar year. I mean, you're, it's like changing the rules of the soccer game in the middle of the match. You know, yeah. it's, it's, you just don't want to do that. You want people to know what they're working with during that year. I suggest maybe every two years, maybe max, but they're not made to be static. The other thing I've seen from time to time, this is an interesting, probably too deep to get into here, but some firms set up compensation schemes for their senior associates or even non-equity partners that work within sort of normal parameters. But if you get skewed out too far out on the long tail, they're making so much money under this system that you never even imagined that it would happen that then you have to sort of reel it back. And that's a hard conversation to have, but I've helped people sort of have that conversation. And then if you ever want to elevate them to an equity partner, you're basically, you know, they're going to have a worse deal if they become an equity owner than they do under this scheme you've set up as a non equity owner. So you got to be careful when you design these things for the now, but also for the long term and what you think this person in this role may grow into later. I think that's right. You know, we, we've heard more than once stories of particularly plaintiffs contingent fee firms that set up a compensation plan, which sounds affordable and reasonable. And then you know, in some instances, it seems like the the non-equity owner or the non-equity lawyer who's in the firm sometimes making more than the owner of the firm because the owner of the firm has all the risks and all the expenses. And it is hard to back that out. The other, you know, the other side of the coin is, you know, I've seen lawyers go, it's uh, hire Jonathan and pay him $150,000. And we have this conversation scheme. Last year, he made four hundred fifty, and That's just too much. And our response always is, well, if he made 450, you should have made a whole bunch more money too. And so let's look at that that way. Let me ask you this, because I do want to go back to this keeping clients things in dissolution. So one of the fears that lawyer owners will have is that if I bring on an associate, for example, and train that associate up, show he or she how to try cases, settle cases, do whatever the practice area is, and they get really good at it, and they watch me learn how to acquire clients that they could get so good they could leave and go compete with me. Therefore, I'm not going to train them up either in skills or I'm, I'm certainly not going to bring them to a great legal marketing mastermind meeting and let them see how we market and build the thing. Uh, but is there, what would be your recommendation on 
how do I protect, how do I build a practice and still protect myself from having associate or associates leave and taking half the clients because the clients have had all this interaction with the associates. I know that there's ethical rules involved. We all know there's ethical rules involved. The client doesn't belong to anybody, but the client is going to make a choice. Okay. And so how does the owner protect himself or herself when the owner may not have a lot of client contact if we're building a firm and scaling it? Great question. Great question. And there's no perfect answer. So I, I have seen a lot of agreements that firms have put in place with their attorneys that when I re review that, I'm like, yeah, that's not going to be enforced. You might as well just not even have an agreement. So the way I approach it is sort of a belt and suspenders, what I call it. So there are things you can do to slow down. If someone's going to leave, let's just talk about that first. If someone's going to leave, there are a number of things that I think are within the ethical bounds that you can put in place that slow the process down enough to give you time to, you know, make a move to try to, you know, make sure things don't happen. So that's the first thing, yeah. slow it down. The second thing, if they do leave and take things worst case scenario, you've got an enforceable fee split provision in place that, yeah. you know, sometimes I see them where they say, if you leave and take clients, you got to pay all the fees back to the firm. That's not going to be enforced. That's the same as a restrictive covenants. Courts have uniformly not allowed that, but there are ways you can structure it that would be enforceable. So you protect your down, number one, you slow it down and you protect your downside. Now let's talk about some like non-legal ways. I think number one, create a place they don't want to leave. I know you talk a lot about that. So that's one, one piece. Another that I suggest for law firm owners, you know, you've got all these attorneys that are developing relationships with these clients. You need to figure out a way as a firm to develop a relationship <clears throat> with the clients as an owner. And there are you know, <laughs> lots of ways maybe you could do that, but let's just say you send Every other week, the owner sends a personalized a video recording of the owner talking to the client, telling them they appreciate the client, whatever. That's just an idea via text or email. But you got to figure out ways to, for lack of a better word, institutionalize the client where they think the firm is their lawyer. And, that, and so you put all of these things together and you reduce <coughs> the downside and maybe the likelihood of this happening. But the last thing I'll say on this is it is a fear, but you know, it's just part of doing business. And if you want to grow, you're just going to have to take the risk. You just got to do it. It is part of the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. And I think you're right. So, you know, what we try to do here is really build out a brand that has the brand in front of clients a lot. Great eight page, full color monthly newsletter, electronic newsletters, Brian and I doing things that are you know, in social media and other ways that are just not related to legal at all. Like, hey, we're nice guys. Why would you ever want to leave us? So there's there there are ways to, as you said, like to be there, even if you're not the one that's doing all of the legal work and having the phone calls with the client. Let me ask you about this, because you mentioned something about fees. I've heard of lawyers. I'm curious what you think about this. Conti plan is contingent fee lawyers. And part of the deal is, hey, you know, we're going to front the costs. And we don't pay us a fee until the end of the case. And one of the provisions I've seen is, for instance, well, if you do leave the firm, like all the costs that we've incurred are due and payable, like right now. Have you seen that? Have you thought about that? Because you use the word fees. I'm using the word, the costs I've advanced on the case. And I knew one for, big firm that this was a way to keep people from leaving because they were doing big cases a lot of time fronting, you know, 50 to $300,000, $400,000 in costs and making it really untenable to leave. Do you mean the client would have to pay or the attorney yeah, leaving would yeah. have to pay? So, I, so you, Jonathan, you're the client and I'll, I'm going to advance the cost of litigation and I'm in a hundred thousand and you want to leave fine, but you got to reimburse me the cost right now because that's in our contract. You agreed to that when you signed up. And so I don't know a case on point. I can imagine a court would say, yeah, that's enforceable, but are you really going to get, if you're advancing the cost or is the client really going to pay? I mean, the client may just say, you know, 
good luck. I don't have the money. Good luck. I'm doing where I want to go. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. All right. I, we've not done it that way. We don't have this issue. Now, now the other piece, you know, that's against the client. The other potential is to say, all right, to the attorney, if you're taking the, if you're taking the client, you got to pay back the expenses. That. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. And so for that, I think, again, I think if you, let's say it was a hundred thousand in advanced expenses, let's say it's a med mal plaintiff's case. I think some courts might say that's the same as a non-compete because you're restricting the ability of the lawyer to leave. So you might not be able to say you got to pay it all back immediately or within 30 or 90 days, but you definitely would get it back if, and when there was ever recovery for sure. For sure. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, that's a given, you know, one of the interesting things. So, I, so there's a lawyer here in Virginia and went through a law firm breakup years ago. It was a contingent fee breakup, contingent fee firm. And one of his things is, Hey, that firm took other cases and we're resolving cases within a year of their coming in and they're taking five and six years to resolve cases. And he's frustrated because he's got some money in those cases and he can't do anything to make those lawyers do their work any faster. And I don't know how, I don't know how you prevent that. There's so many things to think about. Just give me a guess, Jonathan, how many of all the lawyers who, are, who have this law firm development process going on, are most of them seeking out guys like you? Or are most of them thinking, I'm a lawyer, how hard can this be? Let's go paper the deal and see what happens. I think most are not seeking out people like me. I think... And the tip of that, you know, I, I have seen, so, I mean, I've seen hundreds of law firm partnership agreements, hundreds, and they're of varying degrees of what I'll call quality for a law firm. And some are, have been drafted by, you know, really credentialed, smart corporate lawyers, but they're not built for law firms because those lawyers aren't ethics lawyers. They didn't do law firm breakup disputes. And so they may have an agreement, but it's really not worth much. And then there's others that, you know, it's a handshake. It is a pure handshake, or maybe it's a one pager on a napkin that says, this is how we're going to do it. And that is okay, but not very good at all either, because it doesn't address the breakup, what happens in yeah. all these scenarios. And so, you know, a lot of lawyers, I think if they've been through a breakup, they look for somebody like me because they've done it and they're like, okay, I don't ever want to go through this again. But part of what I have to do is educate them on the value proposition. And when they, oftentimes when they learn about me, they say, okay, yeah, we want help. Now, let me ask you this about your own practice. So who do you serve? I think you're licensed in more than one state. Are you, is your, is the type of work that you do limited essentially geographically to where you are licensed or can you act as consultant advisor to, to for anybody who might be listening to this podcast and go, Hey, sounds like Jonathan would be a good guy to at least talk to. Let me hire him and pay him a consulting fee or whatever, or maybe even engage him full on to help organize my law firm in Virginia. I don't know. Can you do that? Yes. Short answer. Yes. So we cover with the lawyers we have here, we cover, you know, maybe five, six, seven States with licenses there, you know, there are a few States, many States have what's called a multi-jurisdictional practice rule that, you know, I think in certain circumstances we can help there. Some States do not have that. So either we would need to associate with someone who's licensed there or, there are parts of what I do that are non-legal that are really sort of almost advisory or consulting like, so we could structure some sort of engagement where I'm just advising and not really giving legal advice. Awesome. What haven't we talked about that you think lawyers really should know more about or should know that they don't know and need to really go out and hire out expertise? I think another area that I really think all lawyers should look at and really haven't is, you know, what do all law firms need? They need clients. And what's, how do you enter in a relationship with a client? You have an engagement letter, a retainer agreement. And a lot of lawyers have just pulled a form from somewhere, borrowed it from somebody, maybe gotten it from online. And they really have not given it much thought. And there are a lot of provisions that may not be enforceable. There may be a lot of provisions that would be better if they're in there. So I think looking at your client retainer agreement would be huge for any law firm out there. And I encourage folks to do that. And that's one of the services you provide. I know you have looked, as you said, hundreds of partnership agreements. I'm sure you looked at 
hundreds, if not a thousand <laughs> fee agreements and retainers. And I've read a lot of cases about it. Yes. So, yeah. The biggest issue that you see in cases and fee agreements is what? Just the various ways that a case may and may resolve or play out just aren't covered in the agreement? Well, you know, let me give you an example for a plaintiff's firm in Georgia. Different states do this a different way, but if I have a contingency fee agreement with a client and they fire me and go hire another lawyer, generally speaking, I can go get quantum merit. I cannot get the contingent fee that I thought I had. Now in Georgia, there are some magic words I call it that you could put in that agreement that at least theoretically you could get the contingent fee on the last highest offer, right. but you have to have that in the agreement. And if you don't, you're getting quantum merit and that's just not fun and it's not going to be much. So that's a good example for contingent fee lawyers. For hourly lawyers, there are certain things you can put in there about collection costs and that sort of thing. And of course, I mean, there's all sorts of other disclosures and things that inform consent and waivers and all these things you, you, that if you put them in your agreement, they've signed it, it's there. You don't have to worry about it. And if it's not there and then you get sideways with the client and they come back at you, you don't have these protections that could have been there. One of the things that, you know, you're always trying to balance in a fee agreement, like too much information, you know, you can unsell the, the sale of the case if you're not careful. One of the things that surprised us when we moved to, you know, DocuSign type signing fee agreements is how quickly some of these came back. <laughs> so ours are pretty robust and, you know, people weren't reading them. I don't think, like, I don't think they could have been reading them. Great. So Jonathan, why don't you give us the URL? So, so anyone's listening to this podcast, first of all, go and subscribe to listen to a bunch of episodes of the founding partner podcast. Jonathan's interviewing a lot of interesting guests. This is the thing that keeps him going. He loves lawyers and make, helping them ha really have a happier life by avoiding, you know, these potential sidetracking pitfalls that come just because there isn't a lot of pre-planning, even though we are lawyers. And then it, it, the website is lawfirmgc.com. Is that it? It's uh, yourlawfirmgc.com. Yourlawfirmgc.com. Maybe someone else already had lawfirmgc.com. That's right. That's right. Out of Atlanta, Georgia. Jonathan, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us on the podcast today. It's been great. And this, I'm sure this can be very valuable to a lot of lawyers who listen to this deal. Well, thanks for having me, Ben. I right, enjoyed man. it. Talk later. See ya. If you like what you just heard on the Renegade Lawyer podcast, you may be a perfect fit for the great legal marketing community. Law firm owners across the country are becoming heroes to their families and icons in their communities. They've gone renegade by rejecting the status quo of the legal profession so they can deliver high quality legal services coupled with top notch customer service to clients who pay, stay, and refer. Learn more at greatlegalmarketing.com. That's greatlegalmarketing.com.